and I think it's like this for everyone, most issues in your life can be fixed by training. What's happening, guys? Welcome to a new episode of Jester Radio. Today's guest, I met him back in Pretoria. Actually, no, probably in Bryanston. Switch. The OG switch, or the what? at least for me it was. And then you guys actually opened one up in Pretoria and we were working there together. So, Devin Miller, bro, thank you so much for coming through. Thanks, Jesse. Glad to be here. I've been following you for quite a while now. and It's yeah, good to see your growth and, and your podcast going so well. Thank you, bro. I appreciate that. So, starting off, the reason you're here today is you guys are doing something incredible. You're doing something for charity, which most people... You know, they just either give money or they just give things that are easy. And you guys are doing something that's exceptionally difficult. So you guys are, you're running to Cape Town. That's correct. So do you want to explain the process <laughs> of that? <laughs> that's what everyone says, running to Cape Town. It sounds pretty crazy. Yeah. It's it's quite cool. Um, so it's called the Mad, it's called Mad to Run. Um, it's Make a Difference Foundation. Um, and the idea was they want to raise money and a cool way to do it and a cool way to generate hype around it was let's run to Cape Town. Um, so you don't run the whole way. Obviously that would be a thousand. I think your total distance covered is a thousand five hundred Ks. Um, there's a team of 36 people and you're basically broken up into teams of eight people. So each team is responsible for running 80 Ks in a, th- in a, in an eight hour shift. So basically every person on that team, minimum distance you have to cover will be 20 Ks. And it's 24 hours. So there will always be someone running. Every eight hours, there's a team running. So from the 7th of October, we start, leave Nelson Mandela Square. And then until we get to Cape Town for seven days, there will always be two people running, which is which is pretty cool. Um, and I'm pretty excited about the challenge and, and the journey. Yeah. And obviously, there's so many runners. I assume each team will obviously finish at different stages. Each team will obviously have their own car that's following them. And if, you know, you running really quick, your team and your vehicle, your backup vehicle sticks with you, other people stay behind. So obviously you're going to be running on like our commercial, our general roads. Yeah, 100%. So they've, I mean, it's quite a logistical nightmare and the, the lady running it is it's a beast. So she's actually got different, because you obviously also, so when another team's running, your team's, drives off to a site to camp and you basically sleep or try and recover. But basically every eight hours you'll be back onto the road okay. at a different spot in the route. Um, so they've planned this whole route down and it's pretty a logistical nightmare, you know, food, water, drinks, vehicles following you. And obviously safety is a big concern. Um, we're not running along the main like roads down to Cape Town. So there are these yeah, go around on the N1. Dirt, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll be asking for trouble. Um, so you are running on the smaller dirt roads. I've heard that the, the path through the Karoo is absolutely spectacular. If you get a shifter in the night, you know, you just, there's nothing the tank around The Tankwa Crossing, I think, that, that road there. Possibly. I think I think it, uh, that sounds sounds right. Yeah, that, I think they do a lot of endurance, endurance events there where it's relatively flat. And, you know, people go and they run, you know, ultra marathons there. Yes. Cause you can, or they do a loop and they have camps and you can keep going like that. So you obviously... You say the minimum or roughly everyone needs to, within your team needs to run, you know, 20 Ks, but you can obviously like do 40 and yeah. your other teams can maybe do 10 or. So how it works is you'll just do a double shift. So if your shift is, let's say you're going to run for two hours, you're going to do 20 Ks. I'll just do, well, we're aiming to do, me and my, my friend called Sean Gunn, we're aiming to do 42 Ks. So a marathon every day for seven days. Crazy. So how have you prepared for that? Because obviously you've be, you've done events and we'll get into what you've done and your preparation for that. But have you been training for that specifically? <laughs> it's quite funny, actually. We did the, myself and my fiance, Robin, did the Nasna Marathon. That was a tough run. And since then, I haven't run in five weeks. Okay. I started training on Tuesday this week for Mad to Run. So kind of seven weeks out, I think I said to you, yeah, 7th of October, and basically start my prep work for Mad to Run now. So, you know, you obviously, you know, you're a hybrid athlete, you're in the gym every day, you're also running, you're doing all of these things. So how has your training changed? Because you say, you know, you haven't run for five weeks, but you've obviously, have you been doing weights? Have you been doing that kind of stuff? Yeah, of course. So I'm involved obviously at Gold's Gym. Yeah. That's my full-time position there. I run the gym and I have a small shareholding in the gym. Um, and it's something I'm truly passionate about training and meeting different people, 
um, building a community. That's what we're big on at Golds. Um, so you have to kind of running a gym. I'm passionate about gymming, bodybuilding. And part of running, I've always wanted to maintain size, which is like the true, it doesn't kind of work. Yeah. I'm sure you, I've seen you do it. Yeah, it's it's, like, tough. it's really, really tough to maintain size and then obviously bring in the endurance side where you just destroy that muscle, break it down. So I kind of took a break from running, bulked up a little bit. I'm up to like 88, 86 kilograms now. So I'm going to try to hold on to that as I start prepping for man to run, keeping, probably doing small, small runs every day, five times a week, but then coming straight off the run into, let's say, a, bo a bodybuilding mm. session just to try to keep that size. I haven't really done it this way before, so I'm going to see the next seven weeks kind of how the training goes yeah. and how that, that type of of training works but essentially to be a hybrid athlete you need to have you know stages and phases of your training where you need to you know after your marathon you now obviously went to more gym based training and then now you're obviously trying to incorporate both but the weights do take a little bit of you know they go to the wayside a little bit you know so awesome. maybe the duration will change a little bit you'll maybe focus more on compounds you'll do certain things to obviously try and maintain that size but then improve endurance. And that's also obviously difficult because the lighter you are, the easier it is to run. So yeah. it's a it's a catch-22 because to run better, you need to be lighter. But because of your passion and what, what you enjoy, you also what, don't want to be lighter. No, it's it's really hard. So when, I, I mean, two kgs doesn't sound like much. When I did my first run on Tuesday, you know, you're looking down at your watch and also as a runner, you're obsessed with yeah. splits and speed and looking at my watch and my heart rate, I'm thinking, geez, like maybe I should just ditch the weights and just focus on the running. I thought, no, no, there is a way to do this. You just got to get comfortable running heavier. Mm. Well, I mean, I'm sure you obviously know Nick Bear. Of course. Yeah, and he's probably the number one person, I think he is the number one person in terms of, you know, maintaining that size and, you know, being able to do endurance sports. And I think there's a lot to learn from him. There's a lot to, I mean, even... I was what I've been obviously following you for a while and seeing what you do and seeing the intensity that you train and then in the gym and then still be able to you know do the the mileage that you do in running and that's obviously quite motivational and inspiring and you know you mentioned the community aspect of Gold Gym and that's something that is the brand you know the brand is you know when people say you know gold's gym they picture Arnold training they picture all these you know goats in the gym pumping iron and everyone's having a good time everyone's filming themselves everyone's you know documenting and that's what's nice about gym a uh, gold's gym and separates it you know from virgin and planet fitness maybe planet fitness is a bit more lenient but you know at virgin active you pull out a camera those oaks are like put Shut that camera down. away so that's what's nice to see at golds is you know it's for the people that are trying to put out information and inspire and help people because you're allowed to do that there yeah 100 percent. so i think you know, it's always tough for Virgin Active and Planet Fitness. They're massive gyms. They've got, mm. you know, to try and manage that many facilities, I would not want to do that. That's basically impossible to then, because then how do you, you, you can't control it. Mm. Then you kind of, they have to take quite a strong stance, I think. Whereas at Gold's, you know, I'm there every single day. Um, so I understand what guys are trying to do. And we obviously have the likes of a side. We've got Pillow, we've got these guys. They're in the gym there. They're creating community and they're genuinely helping people. So they'll be in there filming, <clears throat> sorry, they're in there filming content, which is going to help inspire mm. guys that aren't sure what they're doing. And, you know, there's nothing better. We got these massive pictures of Arnold Schwarzenegger in the gym and there's like that golden era of pumping iron. To see guys training in that community, being in, you look across, you've got these huge guys pumping massive weights. They'll come across and help someone out, you know, who's just getting started or who might be slightly younger, you know, these like matric guys coming through, not sure what to do. That that energy that you get in the gym is insane. And that's what I'm pretty much addicted to. And that's yeah. why I still enjoy, you know, the bodybuilding style of training. Um, yeah, it's such a it's such a cool feeling to be yeah. a part of. And also it is, you know, bodybuilding, you know, with running, you can look at it and you can say, yeah, you know, my heart rate was lower in this easy run or I was able to run 21Ks without being as sore the next day. But, you know, the results aren't, they are measurable and they obviously are very measurable, but compared to bodybuilding, they're not as measurable. And I think that's why people enjoy the bodybuilding style of training more is because, you know, sculpting your body is relatively 
easy, you know, in terms of seeing those results. Because if you are dedicated and if you are, you know, working harder, the results are visual. Whereas with running, it's the results are just stats. 100%. And yeah. you probably, obviously it depends on what the look you're going for, but with running, the faster you get, you know, the better endurance you have, probably the skinnier you're going to get. 100%. But with bodybuilding, you know, the harder you train, the world standard of what looks good, it's, you know, that's what you work towards. 100%, yeah. Um, of course, and I think each person has to decide what they want from their training. Mm. I think number one, you have to make sure you enjoy what you're doing. Bodybuilding, running, that's key. You've got to find some sort of passion in it. What got you into endurance? I, I, th- I seem to think that you did rowing huh, in school. Yeah, so when I was in school, I, I rowed for South Africa for four years. I then coached rowing for five years, also to a national level. Um, at the time, so when I was joining the national squad, I was trying to be part of the Olympic team for t- the 2016 Olympics. Rowing is a brutal, brutal sport. We are training 15 times a week. True. Um, and at that stage, I was obviously in Pretoria at Tux, and I think quite an immature athlete. You want the, At that stage, I was 21, 22. You want the best of everything. You want to go out partying, you want to study, you want to row professionally, and it's so easy to get it wrong. Mm. You're not looking after your nutrition, you're not sleeping right, you're drinking too much. And basically, long story short, you just can't sustain that that level of output. And eventually said, okay, I can't do rowing anymore. And that's when I kind of almost resented endurance sports and went quite, a, quite heavily into bodybuilding. Just at the time, it was what people around me are doing, always enjoyed it. And picked it up. But then as I started to not really get older, but just mature a bit more in my perspective on training and working, uh, that's when the endurance side started coming back in because it does provide such a good structure and mental workout. Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing. And I want to talk about that, the mental side of endurance sport. Because with gym, you know, it's I would say the mental side in terms of bodybuilding is the diet. Whereas sure. maybe on leg day, there's slightly more of a mental aspect with bodybuilding. But essentially, there's not too much of a mental game when it comes to bodybuilding other than diet. Whereas with, you know, endurance sports, you know, when you are an hour in, you've already burnt a thousand calories. That's a lot more than you would burn in an hour of a weight session. Then you, you know, you've got another two hours, two and well, it obviously depends the duration of what you're doing. But you've got to just keep going and you have to have that mental fortitude to be able to say, you know, I can't stop. I gotta keep going. Because I mean, obviously it depends the style of endurance, but your heart rate's probably usually gonna be at least over 140, 150 for that entire time of, you know, an hour to three hours sometimes, depending if it's running, cycling, whatever. So you your first long endurance um event was the sky run it was 62 k's that's correct so sky runs actually it's a 100 k trail run did you do the 100 yeah i did okay. the 100 um and it's through the Witterberg mountain range so it's a fully self-supported self-navigated run which makes it i mean that was an appeal to me i basically mm-hmm. typed in google i said hardest running events in south africa sky run pops up it, I prom- it's probably one of the hardest events or trail runs in the world i'd say it is it's an absolutely a brutal Events. I remember watching your Instagram stories. It was so cool. Um, and the build up to that. So I basically took a year to prep for that. So it's, it's usually on the third weekend of November. I decided to do it in January last year and basically just committed 100% to endurance. I mean, I, I, when I started, I was like, had this idea that I could maintain strength, but not being exposed to endurance enough, I quickly realized it's not going to work. You kind of, I wanted to be quite competitive in the run and that's when I went full into just endurance and seeing how fit I could get. So that hundred, I mean, because obviously you can't train doing a run of 100 Ks each week or whatever. You can't train even doing like a 60 K run every week. So how does your training change? Obviously going just the endurance part of your training. How was that, you know, to build up that mileage to be able to do 100? And obviously, you know, it's, I think it's on the border of like Lesotho and everything. So it's a lot of mountainous climbing. It's all it's all climbing. I think you climb it's three thousand meters sure. elevation that you climb over the hundred k's, and I mean some of the climbing is it's just ridiculous. Mm. You you basically on your hands and knees, and there's no path. So when they say self navigated, everything's on your your watch. 
you they say go at the start line and then there's nine checkpoints that you have to tick off so it's basically like every 10 k's there's some guy standing there with a little checkboard you come through you give him your number so it's not like a water point where there's cook sisters no water <laughs> points there's none of that i think there's there's two actually i'm lying there's two water points where you can refuel your backpack but I mean, you have to have that but you you have to have that just purely yeah. for, you're, you're for, di- for you need you're, water you're die, yeah because <laughs> i mean so what was the well, how long did it take you it took me 17 hours so um, obviously you're running sometimes in the dark yeah so you start at four in the morning then i did the last so four in the morning finished at nine o'clock at night so the last kind of in that stage kind of summer so it's the last like two hours where we're dark and then you then it's brutal yeah i mean you've been running for 16 hours starting finishing to just in the, the dark the, the, it's getting dark you got like your little headlamp and at that stage you're what what i also enjoy about trail running and these sort of really tough events the emotions that you go through and being able to just keep yourself neutral you know you can't get too excited you can't get too upset you just got to be neutral all the time and just move forward um, which which you learn you learn a lot about yourself yeah because i mean essentially so it, i mean uh, in, in a mountainous region you can get all seasons within so- one day you know you can be hot you can be cold can be windy it can rain so there's a lot that you have to obviously accommodate for and you have to keep on going because it's self-navigated it's not like oh I'm just going to stop because it's on a road. Now I can just pull off and there's a car here. Yeah. Uh, so I did the, the, if anyone does want to do Skyrun, I'd say you have to do the training camp. Um, hundred K, you know, comrades is 96 and it's a, it's a road run. It's a, there's no comrades is a tough run, mm. but there are ways to bail out. So going into Skyrun, I had an idea. I knew it was going to be tough, but you don't realize how tough the terrain is and how remote it is. So I went, decided I was going to do the training camp. And that's when kind of I, th- I was sitting at the the race briefing the night before, and this is training. So you do the run over two days and the guys, they start talking to you. And I thought, oh my word. What have I got myself what into? What the hell is this? He's talking about make sure you got, you ready. There might be snow up there. There might be hailstorms, rain. And they basically say, if that happens, find some shelter. You have to carry like a space blankets and there's all these requirements for safety. Basically find a shelter. Uh, we'll try to get you off the mountain in the morning no one's coming to get you you kind of you have to be fit enough to survive if wait out goes whatever wrong. yeah yeah and that's when i was sitting in this race briefing and thinking shit this is going to be tough luckily i knew it was a tough race so i trained flipping hard for the event and in the training run i managed to meet up with these two guys a guy called doug, doug Picard, and then a guy called christian Hailinger. top 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 runners and i learned so much from them in the the two days that we spent. So just like little tricks, how you navigate through the mountains, how you conserve energy, where to push, where to kind of walk and tap off a bit. Um, those are huge lessons. And, you know, leading up to this, other than the training camp, what type of runs were you doing? Because obviously we don't really have access to many mountains here in Joburg. So, you know, what were you doing in terms of runs? So every weekend I'd go to Volvo Sprite. It's in Pretoria. Mm-hmm. Just like... I chose Volvo Sprite because it's really easy to get to. And there's some mountains and yeah. And then I'd usually just do two laps of Volvo Sprite on the weekend. And then during the week, the biggest lesson, like I think any athlete should take or runners, is particularly what I noticed. I obviously trained with Mavericks during the week, but what I noticed training was, and I picked this up from rowing, is when you run easy, run easy. When you train hard, you need to train flipping hard. Um, and that's where I think most people get it wrong because they train at this like sub level when they're running fast. Let's say you're a six minute run at steady. You train fast, you run at five thirties and they're not really like emptying the tank. So if you're doing a hard training run, make sure it's a hard, hard training run where you're absolutely torturing yourself. You know, you want to stop and, and throw up because that's the only way you're going to really see big improvements. When you're doing a light run, make sure it's a light run. Don't try and, you know, you're thinking about Strava the whole time and you, you're running faster than you should be. You don't want people to think you're a slow <laughs> runner because it's going to be on Strava. 100%. So you've got to be quiet. You've got to kind of remove your ego. When you're running slow, run slow. When you're running hard, make sure you absolutely empty the tanks. And that's one of the things I think I did well and that will set you up for, for the race because the reality is when you enter the race, if you haven't suffered during training, it's not you're not suddenly going to be, oh, it's race day, turn on the or unlock this magic mm. ticket you have to do the work in training and that's the only way it will come out on race day and especially because you know if you go train a volvo spray the weather's going to be the same while you're there 
But now, obviously, on race day, the weather's going to be different. The terrain is definitely more climbing. So there's everything, everything. on race day is going to be more difficult. So you have to try to push yourself as much as you can during the training. As much as you can, especially like doing runs if you're a bit tired. Um, even if you're not feeling good, I often say it, you're not going to feel good on race day. That's the reality a lot of the times is that usually you, you don't sleep well the night before. You're in a different bed. You've eaten funny food. Um so do runs when you're not feeling good because that's that. those are the runs that probably matter the most or the training sessions that matter the most. Did you ever do any... I've been trying to do this, just playing around, you know, where you go and do like deliberately doing like a fasted session to try obviously push that endurance or the capability of your body to utilize on a relatively empty stomach. So, you know, for myself, if I'm doing anything over an hour and a half, let's say, I'll eat before, obviously, just so I can try, obviously, perform to a maximum capability because when you're fasted, you're not going to perform as well. So do you sometimes, or did you at least, or going forward now, would you also deliberately do something fasted? Because, like, you know, when you your, your energy levels dip, then you would maybe have a bar or a goo or something and pick yourself up. But if you can obviously go a little bit longer without having to do that so that on race day, you know, when you're doing it every hour, when you do have it, it pushes you even more and gives you more energy. Yeah, definitely. I think what you're saying there is important, but you have to have a an idea what you want from the session before you start it. So if your goal is to try and basically make sure you function better, I used to do often sessions fasted or I'd do sessions in the middle of the day when it's hot mm. And I'd do a switch class and then leaves the switch class and go straight into like a 10, 20K run. Um, not without drinking any fluids, without e eating anything. Just to try to see how you feel mm. in those sort of zones. Maybe improving your, your, your basically your energy systems. Um, but obviously nutrition, and the more you get into this, the more you realize how little you know about nutrition, training. Because obviously those are huge, huge components is the nutrition side, yeah. when to eat, what to eat train fasted not training fasted and that's a big lesson i had to learn because i only I, I first started when i bought my bicycle in december and i was cycling with my dad and because obviously i always i fast usually like 16 hour fast or whatever when i was doing like a three four hour cycle i was like Ugh, i can i can do a fasted session it's four hours it's not that bad yeah. and then like after two hours my energy just crashes and like i, I remember i was it was like three and a half hours into the cycle i was dead i should have definitely eaten my dad he had enough for him but i didn't tell him that i needed food because obviously he would have given me if i was really but i was trying to just like trying to be a man trying to push not let him know how much i'm suffering and then i was literally i was so tired i was falling asleep while i was going down these hills like i couldn't pull my brakes properly because i was so tired and then you kind of learn if you want to perform at the height of what your body can do you do have to eat and you have to you can't focus on trying to be as shredded as possible when you're doing these events and that's something that a lot of people are within that you know came from both of what you and i did was trying to be as big and lean as possible going into these events and endurance activities is you know you need to think about how fed you are and how much energy your body has rather than how shredded you are when you're doing these things. Yeah, and it's, you learn that mistake very quickly. I used to do the same thing. But basically, I also I listened to a podcast and the guy said, the, more, the advantage is the more you can eat, basically the more carbs you can get in while you're even running or like 10 minutes before you run, the better you are. There's, you can't like eat enough you have to mm. just keep eating and eating and eating because the that's only thing is maybe fuel. needing to go take go to the bathroom that's, while yeah, you're running. So they, that's it that's what they're talking about they would these guys would they try athletes they would train themselves part of their training would be just to stuff their faces and basically train their guts to hold in that food and get comfortable running on these heavy stomachs because then you know there's just energy for your muscles all the time um, but again it's not always practical right so for us, you do especially want to on a hundred k run in the <laughs> mountain, you can't exactly pack oil, bananas, yeah, exactly. and everything. So you do need to you need to be uncomfortable. You need to do rides like that because you learn so much about yourself, and that might happen in the race where you find yourself in that position where you're depleted, and you got to figure out how your body will recover eventually. You just keep going. You somehow the body's incredible. You'll you'll come back and you'll hit a, another wave. Mm. Um, but I learned. I saw you had um, Stella on, and they run at Mavericks. So one of my best training sessions was the a Wednesday morning track session with with those guys because they it's always cool to compare yourself against world class athletes. 
And for those sessions, then I'd make sure I wake up early, have a, have some caffeine, you know, eat something so that you're ready to take on that session. Whereas a session, just a random steady state run, then I might do it fasted or then, but the, the, the purpose of the session was different. You know, a steady state run, yeah, you can get away with being a little bit dehydrated or not being fueled. Mm. But if you want to go and perform against like Stella, for example, uh, try to keep up to her, then you've got to be yeah. ready. And so obviously, other than the two water points, you need to carry all your water and you need to carry all your food. So what type of things were you carrying? Because obviously you were working with Mavericks, so obviously they were guiding you and also, and also obviously the training camp. So what kind of things would you carry? Because, you know, you've obviously got your, you know, your running backpack, you've got your one and a half liter, two liter bladder, whatever it may be. You know, what type of foods are you having? How did you work that? So for that, you, you, your backpack basically weighs uh, 10 kilograms. You run with three liters of water. Well, I actually made sure I had a carbohydrate drink, like heavy carb drink in my backpack. And then, Again, race day, you never know what's going to happen. So on the training camp, I was eating just goose. I felt so sick just eating those. So I thought, let me try and... So I packed nuts, I had like a banana, a few more solid foods, but then I also packed far bars. Those things saved my life, far bars and goose. Mm. Try to eat solids on the day. Was, the first you start, you go up this massive climb. You climb for the first 10Ks. And general rule is you want to be eating or consuming... I just had a timer on my watch actually every 40 minutes eat a far bar first 45 minutes I tried to eat some nuts just could not get any solid foods down so I basically just every 45 minutes I'd have two goos and then just keep sipping on my electrolyte drink or mm. carb drink on my, on my and back. that's also difficult because when you running your heart rate's really high then you go and try eat something and you're basically taking out your ability to breathe, breathe as well so then your heart rate shoots up that's obviously why goos are great but i've also found goos at certain points are cool but solid food does give me more energy just yeah. because it feels like you filling yourself a little bit more and you everyone's different so you have to find what works for you a lot of guys would do like peanut butter and um syrup sandwiches there's so many variables out there. You have to find the mm. right source for you. And that's why you have to do it in training. You have to do practice runs where you try eat. Um, also, you don't know how it's going to affect your stomach. So you have to you have to practice what you're going to do in race day. Yeah. And that's also the biggest thing because it's a bit grotesque, I guess. But I, I, when I did my first uh, half marathon trail run, it was in Hearties. And that was, also, that was also a lot of climbing. So in the 21Ks, we did 1.5 kilometers of elevation gain. So that's yeah, also a, a lot in 21Ks. So I also, this is still when I was obviously, I guess I'm still actually figuring things out, but I needed to go to the bathroom during the run and you're on a mountain there's people around you it's not really something that's manageable and easy to do so i kind of had to wait for an opportunity where there was no one around me quickly go into a bush take my bossy and then obviously carry on at the run so you obviously i mean running 19 hours you're gonna need to go to the bathroom at some point you know the funny thing is i don't think you're not a runner until you've done a, <laughs> a boss crack actually <laughs> you actually can't call yourself a runner until you you've had the runs or I've had terrible stories of running and some days your stomach is just not cooperating. Yeah. But funny enough, on Skyrun, I only I had two wheeze, didn't need the bathroom okay. once. I think, you know, I was I was the, I went there to try and race it as hard as I could. I wanted the top ten finish and my goal was to run in seventeen hours. So I was you know, my heart rate was pretty much in the red for and like when I say red, like, you know, maxing like mm. I think I averaged one sixty or something for those seventeen hours. Sure. And you I don't know, the body just I, was, I think just consuming yeah you were burning so meat. much yeah. and whatever you were consuming was just being utilized so there's no like wastage almost yeah. so what did you learn most about yourself you know that you've been able to also implement in business and daily life from that sky run biggest thing i think is you need to train your mind all the time it's like any other muscle in your body even finishing sky run i then took a break from training you quickly everything you've gained mentally from the, those training sessions you know You've got to run 80Ks a week. You still, in a, I mean, running a gym is naturally an active environment. Being disciplined. So you you put in all these systems and procedures and you become mentally very, very strong. You understand your body. Your time management gets better. And that's what I enjoyed about the build-up to Skyrun. 
coming off Skyrun, I quickly realized that, wait a minute, if you don't keep training your mind and keep setting yourself up new goals, new challenges, putting yourself in uncomfortable positions, you quickly lose that, that mental grit. You know, it's not something that, okay, cool, I've done Skyrun now. It was really tough. I've got that like mental mindset for the rest of my life. It doesn't, I've, well, from my experience, it doesn't really work like that. You've got to keep training that mindset mm -hmm. and keep finding that grit. And I think that's why if you look at guys like Cameron Haynes or even Nick Bear, those guys are constantly doing, they're finding things to make themselves uncomfortable because you've got to keep grinding away at difficult tasks to to hold on to that mindset. Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, I remember when I was doing boxing and that was obviously difficult, the fighting aspect of it mentally. And then after the fight, I didn't do it. And, you know, the confidence, the ability to know, if I can get in a ring and get punched, it doesn't matter, you know, this other situation in my life is not as bad. Or this yeah. is, and, you know, that's what that mental toughness helps in other aspects of your life. But then, you know, two months, three months after the fight, there's, like that mental toughness actually isn't there anymore. So that's why I started getting into more endurance things because, and it's almost like you get that adrenaline rush and you get that mental growth and, you know, you learn new things about yourself and those things actually kind of fade. That's why, as you say, you know, you need to constantly be setting these new goals and setting these new things to put yourself in these situations where there's nothing else but to, you know, just grow and move forward. Yeah, you have to keep moving forward and find you know, ways to, to keep yourself stimulated. So what are you going to do now? Obviously, are you doing this run to Cape Town? But so the run to Cape Town and then definitely lining up another ultra trail. So I want to do another 160k run. So obviously Sky was 100. There is a 160 option or not? Not for Sky Run. Uh, Sky Run's just the 100k, which is tough enough. I think usually, I think the guys, if you do the 160, there's UTCT, mm. the one in Cape Town. They've just introduced a 160k run there. Is one called UTDT, which is the one in Drakensburg. So I'm looking at one of those. Mm. The Cape Town one is at the end of November. I'm hoping to maybe do that, depending on the timing and how how fit I am, because I don't want to do these events if I'm not yeah, <laughs> not fit enough to enjoy it and and actually race it in a way. So I mean, out of the UT, the Ultra Trail uh, Drakensburg, there's a YouTube video on the one event and. When I first started, it was I, I remember sitting in the on the beach in December watching this video, and it was just so moving and it was so like the amount of emotion that because of like you could just see these people like in the beginning at the start line how nervous they were. You could see the sheer happiness and you know the family and the camaraderie around them finishing because I mean it was like 36 hours of running whatever through the Drakensberg running 160 k's and you see these people and you know you, you want to be that guy you want to be that guy that other people are like you're that's actually incredible that he has put himself through that it's incredible that he has sacrificed so much it's incredible that he has done all these things that you know not everyone will do and I think People, and when it comes to running, it's amazing how quickly you actually do adapt to being able to go further and go longer. But if your mind doesn't get you there first, it's never going to happen. It's never, it's always, oh, mindset's the biggest. I think any sort of sport or training, your mind and that discipline mm -hmm. is critical, critical. And uh, you touch on something there, just inspiring people around you, I think is, is very cool. And going back to goals in the community, even through my run, I've seen guys take on, new challenges and it doesn't always have to be you know running 160 k's mm. for a lot of guys it could just be you know running 5 k's that as long as you finding something that's you know going to stimulate you and challenge you that's incredible and if it's running 5 10 or even just getting back into the gym or you've got to find your kind of thing yeah, that's going that to that's going to work for you and it's all relative because you know Looking at Nick Bear trying to run a sub 250 or whatever marathon or looking at him doing the Leadville, um, Leadville 100. 100. You know, like those kind of things. I look at, like even you talking about doing 160 Ks, I'm like, yo, I don't know if I could ever do 160 Ks. But for me, pushing myself, let's say, to do a full marathon is still as awesome for me as you doing 160 and for that other random person at the gym who's now even just walking on the treadmill for 10 minutes it's because you're doing more than what you used to do 
and that's inspiring. You know, you can build from there. You can get better and you can do more. And I can build up to doing 160 Ks. That person can build up to doing their weight session and then maybe joining you guys for a 10 K run afterwards. You know, those kind of things, it's all relative to a person and people need to also understand that they just need to see where they came from and say, okay, well, this is where I was last year in my training. Look how much growth has been. 100%. So I think what you learn just by starting something new and it's particularly training i find for some reason and i think it's like this for everyone most issues in your life can be fixed by training yeah well i mean it's a massive antidepressant as well so huge i think if you just you know just by showing up to the gym you've already ticked the box in like doing something positive for the day regardless of how crap your day was before you show up to the gym and you get a workout in it doesn't have to be the best workout in the world or the hardest workout but you know, you've done something good for yourself that day. And then you're going to be inclined to start eating a little bit better. You're going to be inclined to working a little bit harder. And as you start to build that mindset, everything else around you becomes a little bit easier, a little bit stronger. You're able to work a little bit harder. Um, your time management gets a bit better or you, you're able to get things done more effectively. But it's just about taking those small steps in the right direction. And then it's not always going to be easy. You've got to like... <laughs> the David Goggins, you know, it's got to be, you've, you're not always going to want to do it. You're mm. not going to always want to wake up and go for a run, but it's those little victories that set you up so well. Yeah. You have to, those incremental changes in your life need to be implemented to move forward. I mean, even something as small as making your bed every morning can have massive benefit in your day. Even something as small as, you know, you drop something or you leave a dish there. You'd be like, oh, I'll clean it later. Just, Ach, no, let me just do it now. Let me quickly go just clean this dish or let me quickly, you know, sweep up that little bit of dirt. And like those type of things help you massively and also becomes a standard. And, you know, if you're not meeting those standards that you've set for yourself, then it feels like you, you know, you're kind of regressing. And those standards in life that you set can be improved on and improving on that, you know, and having those standards, I find for myself at least, is... If I set a standard for myself and I'm always meeting those standards, I'm more positive, I'm more happy, I'm more, you know, motivated because, you know, having something that you expect of yourself and meeting it always has positive results. Yeah, always. And it makes you, if you feel good, at the end of the day, if you feel good about yourself, you radiate that yeah. energy off onto other people. And you, you know, you use the example of, sorry, what is the gentleman's name yesterday? But just about uh, getting Andrew Carruthers, yeah. angry in traffic and like going after someone. And that's generally, it's like, because you're not, ha and I know when I'm in a pissed off mood or, or unleash on someone else, it's usually because I'm not happy with the way I've done something or I haven't trained or it's usually because, you know, you've got an issue that you want to work on. So when you start training, when you start getting your life right, you're then able to actually help other people around you. And which is, that's what I enjoy a lot about being, involved in a community if you're just making small differences to your life and trust me you don't always get it right that's for sure but you start to see the impact you can have around you even with my fiance now robin you know when i'm in a better mood or or training well you know, then i'm inclined to like yeah get home let me clean the house because i know it's if it's not clean it's going to piss her off and mm. and you start to become a little bit more conscious about your impact on the people around you which is which is awesome bro Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for inspiring. I know a lot of people are going to be inspired. I know I'm inspired because, so I'm doing the um, Run the Berg yes. on the 1st of October. And that's my first step into, you know, more endurance activity. And that's, so that's 25 Ks on the Saturday, 25 on the Sunday. Nice. So that's my first step. And then hopefully maybe I'll be joining you on a sky run or an ultra marathon in Cape Town or Drakensberg. I look forward to it. Just be careful. It happens qu quicker than you know.